we'll carry on messing around with the Praga B engine this afternoon, but before that, let's have another slice of history. Praga Baby production resumed in Czechoslovakia after the Second World War, but not the Praga B2 engine. A new engine, the Praga D-Type, which was an 85 horsepower flat four, was used instead. However, the Praga D wasn't the only power plant used, and several Praga babies were fitted with the Walter Micron engine, which was an inverted four-cylinder engine, much like a Gypsy. The Micron was 2.3 litres in capacity and produced 60 horsepower. There were actually two Praga engines for sale when I bought mine. My inner kleptomaniac wanted both, but more usefully, the second engine went back to Czechoslovakia. The gentleman was rebuilding this post-war Praga baby. Originally powered by a Walter Micron, it was then re-engined with a small Continental, but his plan was to put it back into pre-war configuration with a flat twin engine. He used that second engine for spares, and the aircraft was completed and flown. Unfortunately, it subsequently had an engine failure when the engine failed to pick up on short final. Nobody was injured. The aircraft is now being rebuilt, but back to its post-war configuration, this time with a Praga D engine. If, like me, you're potty about pre-war ultralights and flying fleas and the whatnot, then you've probably got a copy of this book by Richard Riding. It's a really nice book. I've had this for years. I think I bought it with a book token that I won when I was an apprentice. It wasn't very difficult to win prizes where I did my apprenticeship. I think most of the other apprentices came right from the bottom of the gene pool. Anyway, mustn't be a snob. At the back of it, it's got some weights and measures, and it states that the Aronka E113 engine weighs 121 pounds, and the Praga B engine weighs 105.7 pounds. So what I thought we'd do this afternoon is look at uh, the Praga engine and the Aronka engine, look at some of the detailed differences before I start putting it all together again. The eagle-eyed amongst you will have spotted that this is a jack crank case. But we'll start off with a Jap and then look at the Praga. Interesting, I weighed these earlier. I don't believe the scales. I used the bathroom scales. Of course, I trod on them first, stood on them first, and they said I weighed a ton, which obviously lying. I think beer and chips is the most excellent diet. Anyway, 25 pounds a piece, almost exactly the same. The Jap engine has a single ball race in the front here. This is the thrust bearing, takes the little pull of the propeller. We'll look at the main bearings when I turn it round. We also have a little cover here, which unscrews. It has a grub screw there. The cover winds off and you can get to the front camshaft bearing. The camshaft bearings don't last very long. They tend to get quite notchy after a, not that many hours. Certainly wouldn't want to run them beyond about 500 hours. I think they get very notchy because of the kind of offset load. Anyway, so that makes accessing the bearing very easy. On the side of the case, the biggest difference is the fact that the Jap only has four studs, although they're man-sized studs. The Praga has six, they're smaller. That's the dipstick float arrangement on the Jap engine. On the back, there's very little difference from this view. If you're wondering why the crankcase is cut away like that, it's uh, merely to facilitate, and in fact, you have to remove the dipstick to do it, facilitate pushing the uh, crankshaft incomplete with the rods. You sort of fold it up so it's all at bottom dead center and then the crankshaft goes straight in complete with the con rods as an assembly obviously we'll do that in a while when we put the praga engine together because it's exactly the same this by a clever process of elimination must therefore be the praga crankcase it's very similar it's got a rather nice screw and dipstick arrangement on the top Go straight into the sump. Doesn't get in the way when you assemble the crankcase either. Quite clever that, as long as one remembers to do it up tight. The front main bearing arrangement is different. The crankshaft is slightly larger in diameter on the Praga engine. We'll look at that in a moment. But it means there was a bit of a limited choice of, of uh, bearings to use as thrust bearings. So instead of using one large race, there's actually two races side by side in there. Those are new ones I fitted. I changed them only because when I had to take the engine apart, or when I took the engine apart, I 
had a bit of a battle. None of it had been a part in years and just getting the prop hub off took uh, quite a lot of effort and a bit of heat. It did jump off, it went bang and sort of jumped across the room. And then the nut behind the prop hub that holds the crankshaft assembly in was very tight and I had to warm it with oxyacetylene torch, not get it red hot or anywhere near red hot, but the bearing cage became red hot almost immediately and I didn't want to sort of use the bearing again. One doesn't really know what's done with its sort of temper, certainly the outer one. And they're so cheap, these bearings, they were, they were a few pounds each. Exactly the same part number as the original, so I put new ones in. You'll notice it doesn't have any cover for the camshaft. In fact, if I move it forward slightly, I don't know whether you can see, but there's a hole there. They obviously, when they bored the camshaft bearing seats, they must have had this all jigged up with a boring bar going right through. And very carefully, that has been plugged and it's not been welded. I think they must have screwed something in, cut it off, peened it over and then filed it flat. The crankcase finish is a bit messy compared to the Jap. I'm sure one can make it a lot better, but sort of from the factory, it's quite untidy. There's quite a lot of sort of, well, marks where they've cleaned the crankcase off. Whether it was sand cast or die cast, I don't know, but it's not as nice as the Aronka crankcase, and it's certainly nowhere near as smart as the Jap one, which of the three, Aronka, Jap, and Praga, the Jap finish is much, much better. Anyway, that's quite interesting. They sort of, well, they don't have any fins, obviously, cooling fins either, but doing it that way, well, it's clever. It did make it a bit of a sod when it came to changing the camshaft bearings, though. I have put new bearings in. Again, the old bearings are here. So less, less than £10 for brand new SKF, exactly the same as the original. Why wouldn't one change them? But I had to make a sort of hook arrangement, heat the crankcase up and use a puller and sort of jump that front bearing out. Once the crankcase is nice and warm and has expanded a bit, the bearings did go out in and out very easily. Just on the side, obviously, biggest difference is the six studs for the barrels. Very little difference inside. Otherwise, that's obviously the front main bearing uh, um, race there or track rather. The biggest difference on the crankcase down here is actually how the carburetor fits. Now, you remember I said I made a, an adapter because I didn't trust the Zenith carburetor because it was filthy dirty and, well, in fact, the Czechoslovakian chaps who had the crash told me that they, they didn't like the uh, Zenith carburetor. They told me to throw it in the bin, which I'm not going to do, but it rather validated my, my decision I made a while back to fit the Stromberg. So unlike the Jap engine, which has a completely separate kind of Y piece on the back, there's a, just like a sort of continental, like a small continental, all the inlet track on the Jap engine and the Aronka engine is bolt on. On this um, Praga engine, and that does go that way around, it, the carburetor bolted straight onto the bottom of the crankcase, much like a, a Lycoming does. Obviously I made that adapter and this is my Stromberg that I've used on a Jap engine, which I'm very happy with, which I'm going to use on this. Obviously it makes the carburetor hang a little bit lower, but that's not a problem. On the Jap engine, the oil strainer and the, the drain plug are in the middle. On this, it's slightly different. So the Praga and the Jap engine, and the Aronka engine obviously, all have an oil pump that sits on the back case, and they draw oil from the sump. Now, the Praga one's quite clever. It's got two strainers and obviously the intake in the middle. So it has a strainer in there, sits in like so, and another strainer on this side that sits in there. And you only need to actually pull one sump plug out to, to drain the oil. I'm not sure what the access is particularly like when the carburetor's on, but let's try. Carburetor goes that way round. And yes, so if you take out this drain plug above the uh, above the float bowl, then you cover the carburetor in dirty oil. That's quite clever. But I say you only need to pull one out. 
Right, lunatic advice moment. Those are magnets on the top of the strainer there. I was messing around earlier. All my strainers in the Vauxhall, or all two of them anyway, have got several magnets on. When I rebuilt the engine about 15 years ago, and when I say rebuilt, it was a sort of redneck bodge up. The engine was absolutely clapped out, but I went through it, new piston rings, honed it, uh, did all manner of things that probably shouldn't, filed the con rods. It's gone like a train ever since and has done umpteen thousand miles and cost about 500 quid. So it was a, a good rebuild, really. Anyway, I put magnets in it and after running it for a while, of course, pulled the strainers and the magnets were covered in ferrous fluff from running in the new rings, etc. This is gonna have new rings and for exactly the same reason, I've put magnets in it. It's a very cost-effective way of making sure there's no nasty ferrous stuff going around the oil because roller bearing engines like this don't like dirty oil. So I think that's really worth doing if you're running any kind of oil strainer at all. And if you're wondering, these uh, holes here obviously uh, have inlet pipes attached to them that go then to the cylinders much like a Lycoming. For those of you who are still awake, we'll move on to crankshafts. This is a Jap 99 crank. So for Americanists, it's the same as an E113 C and D. For the non-anoraks amongst us, that means it's the later crankshaft that has the plain big M bearings instead of the roller bearings like the earlier Aronka crankshafts and indeed the Praga engine. So it just has a plain rod-like so, I've got a set of new bearings here. They're a copper, silicon, cadmium alloy. And when they're worn out, they can be relined with white metal, or as our American friends say, babbit. The front of the crankshaft here is an inch and a quarter in diameter. And very occasionally these crankshafts break. It is through ignorance and poor fitting rather than any particularly poor design. But uh, I managed to do one several years ago. I'm gonna make a separate film about it another day. But just note the back of the keyway here because that's where the cracks emanate from. And the Praga people obviously understood that because they made some changes on the Praga B engine to try and solve that problem. Obviously, this is the Praga crankshaft. Now, the most significant change is at the front. We've already talked about the big end bearings in the first episode. It had 24 of these in each big end, and I've put new rollers in. The diameter of the rear of the crankshaft here is now an inch and seven sixteenths instead of an inch and a quarter, so quite a lot bigger. That's uh, three sixteenths of an inch or nearly five mil in euro speak. And the keyway has been finished differently. Instead of that rounded end with a very quick cross-sectional area change, the keyway has still been cut with a vertical uh, milling cutter in this portion, but then it's been blended out here at the back, I guess to reduce the change in cross-sectional area. When we looked at the crankcase earlier, we saw that the front thrust bearing was a bigger inside diameter. Now that sits there and it's actually the same diameter as the inside of the main bearing here, which is the same, exactly the same as a, as a, a Ronca or a Jap main bearing. So there's obviously no shoulder, unlike the uh, Ronca and Jap crank shafts, which have a shoulder here to hold the bearing, this doesn't. But those clever Czechoslovakian people simply machined up a sleeve that slides on like so. And then once the crankshaft is slid into the crankcase, the thrust bearing sits up against that sleeve. It's a very elegant solution. If you're wondering, yes, I did weigh both crankshafts and they weighed exactly the same amount, 19.4 pounds each. It's almost time to strangle crankshafts to death, but before we go, there's just one more feature I want to look at. The oil for the big ends is fed in from the accessory case, from the back case, via this drilling here. And it goes through the crankshaft, down to the rear big end bearing, and then the center web is drilled and to the front big end bearing. That's the same for all crankshaft types. However, the drillings are slightly different to a normal Lycoming or Continental, any kind of flat four, or indeed any kind of three bearing motor car engine. Normally they're drilled through, so from the rear main bearing, there's a straight drilling through, albeit at an angle, which means the oil comes out on the outside of the crank pin here. But if that was done on these two cylinder engines, then centrifugal force would mean the oil would go into the feed there 
and be jetted out, aided and abetted by its friend centrifugal force as the crankshaft spins, and absolutely no oil would want to go against centrifugal force through the centre web and to the front big end bearing, which means the front big end bearing would last minutes from new and the whole thing wouldn't work at all and be utterly disastrous. The solution is very simple, merely that the crank pins are drilled with the oil ways out onto the journal on the inside of the pin instead of the outside, so there's no effect from centrifugal force whatsoever. In fact, the oil stays in the crankshaft due to centrifugal force and the pump pumps it out into the bearings. And in practice, it works very well, but it's quite an unusual feature on any engine because as I say, normally from every big end, there's a drilling out. So it would be a drilling straight through from there to there. In the case of if this was a Lycoming, there'd be another two crank revs here. This would be the center bearing and it would be drilled that away for that journal and that away for the other journal. It's just rather an interesting feature worth pointing out. That's a Praga cylinder on the left and an Aronka Jap cylinder on the right. I did weigh them and now we're getting somewhere because the Praga cylinder weighs three pounds less than the Jap cylinder. So that's a total of six pounds. Oh, clever mathematical stuff there. Of course, the cylinders do look a bit different and that's because the Praga engine is a near copy of the Aronka E113 engine, which had the Warner Scarab cylinder heads. And the Aronka Jap engine is really a copy of the E113C engine with parallel valves. But apart from that, they're not actually very different, although they look different. That's enough on cylinders. The last area where there's a big difference is the back of the engine. I'll show you why. This is the Jap crankcase. We'll build it up with a back plate and the rear casing. And then of course, to drive the magnetos, we've got this ruddy great gearbox that weighs nine pounds. It works very well, but it is heavy. Now for the Praga engine. And this is the reason the Praga engine is so much lighter than the Jap 99. Instead of nine pounds of extra gearbox, our Czechoslovakian chums widened the back case slightly and put two magneto drives straight through the back case with the magnetos bolted back to back. So the mag goes on like so with the other magneto there. It's a really very elegant solution. Just take the mag away. The drive itself is simplicity. It's merely a gear running on a ball race, another ball race in the casing. So they're sort of close back to back like that with that on the other end and all held together with a pinch bolt. It's very, very clever. To drive it on the inside, they've merely put another uh, gear on the idler gear that goes between the crankshaft and the camshaft and that mates with the gears on the inside of the case. It's absolutely brilliant and it basically saves nine pounds. So we found 15 pounds of weight saving with the cylinders with the back case. So there we are, the book is correct. I'm going to spend a few evenings cutting out gaskets I won't use cornflake packets. I've got some flexoid gasket paper, which is really good stuff and made in the British Isles, I'm pleased to see. I'll also sort out all the nuts and bolts. So next time we look at the Praga engine, it'll be with a view to putting the whole thing together in one or two episodes, depending how we get on. But I'm going to leave you with a mystery. On page 201 of the Richard Riding book, there's a picture of a Hilson Praga. This Hilson Praga had a short life. Its first C of A was issued on 30th of December 1937 and it last flew on the 14th of August 1939. It was scrapped during the Second World War. The mystery is that that second engine, the one that went to Czechoslovakia for spares, was the engine that was on this aircraft when it last flew and according to the logbook had a total of 60 hours. But look closely at that photograph. Unless my eyes are deceiving me, that's a Jap engine, not a Praga engine. And so at some point during its brief 20 month existence, that aircraft must have had a Praga engine, then a Jap engine, and then another Praga engine fitted. How intriguing.